Second first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your Masters Recap episode. That's right. Joining me to break it all down, Kyle Porter is here. KP, what's going on, dude? Not much. I just, I, I feel like I was thinking about this on the way home. I don't know how these guys play 72 holes. I walked 18 each day and I'm exhausted. I don't understand how you, how you play it. Can I, can I tell you something? Uh, so I, I was at Harding Park a couple of months ago and I carried my bag and I was dead five holes in. I don't know how anybody does this. I don't know how caddies do it. I don't know how they do it. It it was grueling. I was on the ground for weeks afterwards. Yeah, we're soft, <laughs> which is why we have a podcast and we don't, well, it's one of a thousand reasons we have a podcast and don't play professional golf. <laughs> yeah, that's the one reason. I just can't walk <laughs> that far. Um, was there a media lottery this year? Nope, no media lottery. Um, everything was different, but it was, you know, and, and I kind of talked about this earlier in the week. It felt like it felt invasive a little bit being like myself being out there. Cause it felt like these pros kind of playing with the members on hand mm. and some volunteers. And I was like, well, what, why am I, what am I doing here? It was great. I loved it, but it was just, the whole thing was very, very strange throughout the week. Yeah. I feel like we're going to get, so much like I don't know it was just strange and stories and things we never would have heard have been heard and things we never would have seen have been seen it's just like is there that's current a little bit have you seen any like asterisk talk because I I feel like this is the one this is the one major where it's like oh well people not being there is really like it it seems like it matters more here than other places man if I see asterisk talk I will block and report all all of that (laughs) Like that is, I mean, I get it, right? We, we talk all the time, the roars, the aura, everything that's going on, but that, that cannot possibly be a a legitimate thought in anyone's brain. Right. Well, I asked DJ afterwards, I I, I had a question in his presser. I said, do you think the patrons not being there helped or hurt you? So I wanted to force his hand. I wanted to choose one of them because we've heard Rory and Tiger talk about how it hurts We've, uh, we've heard other guys talk about how, how it can help. And he said that it, he was like, if I have to choose one, it probably helped a little bit. And, and I would, I, I think I would agree with that because listen, like it was awesome being out there. I got to go 36 with, I went like, I don't know, 60 of DJ 72 holes throughout the week, mm. but there was no juice. Like there was not any, like I, 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 this is dumb. I always get nervous during the masters at a certain point in time, you know, depending on what's going on. I don't know why I get nervous, but I do. <laughs> and I never, ever felt in any of that this year. And that, I think people would expect that, but it was just, it was a very different feel. And I, I think DJ's right. It probably helped him, but I don't know, man. Like I think he's just does DJ stuff, no matter who's there and, and kind of what's going on. Yeah, actually, Leon in the chat, so shout out to the chat, says the only asterisk should be for low scoring versus April, which is not actually that bad of an idea, right? In other sports, you get like, you know, since the live ball era or something like that. But do you think that we will look at the scoring? Like, I mean, we'll go through these. Uh, the records that that Dustin Johnson put up this week are are insane um do you think we will look at them differently because they were they were this was played in november as opposed to april uh i i don't think we will maybe we should i don't think we will. <laughs> it was dude it was so soft rory talked about this on i think it was sunday how it's it's actually a disadvantage to guys like dj and rory when it's that soft because they're you, you have to hit perfect shots when it's hard when it's fast and firm and they're right like the best at hitting perfect shots. And so it's, it's almost like it almost hurts DJ that it was that soft, I think. Um, But it helped him on Sunday because he could kind of just protect the lead. Like he did, there, there was not a number out there other than I guess on 12 that, I mean, Tiger (laughs) showed us, Um, but there, there weren't really numbers out there that, Oh, he can make double here. It just, it never really felt like that. 
Yeah, especially with how in control this game was. So before we jump into DJ, uh, remember, we are on YouTube and also available in podcast form. So if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them in the chat or you can hit hit us up with them on Apple Podcasts in the review section. We will cover as many as possible. Dustin Johnson wins a November patronless edition of the Masters. He does it at 20 under par. Now only three golfers in history have reached 18 under tiger woods in 1997 jordan spieth in 2015 and now dustin johnson this year in 2020 it it was an absolute uh, i don't want to call it stressless because i wasn't in that position kp i thought maybe he felt the tiniest bit of stress on on sunday on number two when he chunks one into the front bunker and then he's got to get up and down out of there but otherwise it was a lot of fairways and greens this week a lot of birdie opportunities and the room never started spinning for him you know what i mean like it it never felt like it got out of out of his out of his grasp yeah he played really smart didn't he like he he kept hitting like the three-wood layup on 13 and he would just kept birdieing it and I don't know, maybe if he makes a couple pars there, we look at that differently. It felt, I guess I don't really necessarily know why he did it. Maybe it was the wind, maybe it was the softness or whatever. I guess on Sunday, he was just protecting the lead on 13. Um, on his approach or on his tee shot? On his tee shot. Oh, okay. Because he on his because he laid up on 13, I think, right? Yeah, he did. He did both days, Saturday right. and Sunday, um, which I thought was interesting. But it, it gets back to our conversation about, like, how do you play this course aggressively but still pick your spots? How do you how do you combine, like, Bryson and Zach Johnson, right? How do, <laughs> how do you, like, you can't be – and I think Mark Immelman was really good on this, and he's right. Like, you can't just, like, be bombs away on every shot, but you also, like – if you're, if you're somebody like DJ, you want to take advantage of your length in some places. Um, you know, the birdie on six was big. And then it, it was funny in his post round presser, he got asked about the chip on, or the, the chunk on two when he chunked it into the bunker. And somebody said, did you, did you feel the, did you see the ghosts of past something like that? <laughs> He's like, I didn't see any ghosts, but when I got to the chip on three, I thought I better hit this solid. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, he's a the best. Day answer, but he got it to the second nine. He's two up, and it was just you know he was he just kind of rolled from there. So I think the lasting image for me was on he birdies fifteen to get to twenty under, mm-hmm. and the scoreboard operator on the scoreboard over fifteen had opened up Cam Smith's numbers, and Cam Smith was the closest guy to him, and he was about to put the number in, and DJ turned away and just started walking to sixteen. And Austin, his caddy, said afterward that he didn't want to know the score. He was just staying in his world and kind of doing his thing. So I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that is pretty cool. First, uh, now see, I I learned I learned something today, Kyle. Uh, I have a note here that DJ was the first wire to wire winner at the Masters since Jordan Spieth. However, someone told me that wire to wire means no ties after any rounds. Are you aware of this? Uh, I would have said that it couldn't. Well, I don't see my wire to wire. You lead after every hole that you play. <laughs> oh my God. But there's, how would you know? What if you tee off in the afternoon on Thursday? Well, re- remember how we talked about that? It has oh, one ever, hole at a time. No, no, no. Has somebody ever led oh. <laughs> like tee off first and shot like a 30 and, and never trail? That would, that's a real wire to wire. <laughs> no, that would, that's, ne- that's never happened. <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, first, yeah, first tea time out, and then ne- birdie the first and never give. You would, you would almost have to do it at like a U.S. Open where everybody tees off ahead of you and they're making bogeys to start, and then you tee off like pretty early, but you make a birdie and shoot like a sixty-seven or something. I don't know. I don't know why we're talking about. This. I don't know, but anyway. So where I was going with this is, uh, I believe there. So there's either been there have been five guys who have ever led by themselves after every single round. The latest to do that was Jordan Spieth, 2015. Dustin Johnson led or co-led after each round. I believe he's the 12th golfer to do that. So either way, uh, very impressive stuff. Uh, historical context. I mean, we can go through 
through some of the crazy uh, things that we have here, right? I mean, he's uh, he he had the scoring record. I think he hit more greens in, in regulation than anybody. He's now under par in nine of his 10 final rounds since the PJ. Like, wh- I don't know where to stop on these stats. They're all just phenomenal stuff. Yeah, they are. Um, I saw somebody tweeted. It might have been Brendan Quinn of The Athletic. He had one three-putt this week, which we can talk about soft greens. We can talk about whatever, but – one three putt when you're contending for a masters is, is pretty sick. Um, you know, I think it, for me, you know, it, I don't even know if it's the numbers. I, and, and this was kind of my column afterward is, and, and I kind of want to get into this and I, cause I want to get your take on it. Obviously the game is all time, all time. Good. Yep. 24 wins, Augusta, Oakmont. But I think he's like kind of, transformed himself into this very earnestly likable athlete. And look, I don't know DJ. I've not been around him. He might be a psycho, but he he's, he's like this weird mixture of um, he, he's easy to feel sorry for because he's lost all these, all these <laughs> heartbreaking majors. But then also like I, you, you have guys, to, I had somebody talking to me today as we're watching DJ and, and they're like, have you ever tried to walk like him? He's like, you look like an idiot. <laughs> I, like, yeah, I know I would. He's like, you're born with that. And so people also <laughs> want to be him. Right. And so he's also got all these gifts, but he's also pretty like works really hard and is kind of low key, a grinder a little mm-hmm. And then the post round presser, like breaking down and cry, like he, he, I, I don't know. And maybe I'm way off on this, like just out of my world, but he, he seems like he's become this very genuinely likable golfer. Yeah. He, he's simultaneously a lovable loser and an all time great, which, is, <laughs> which is, that's hard. That's hard to kind of be both of those things. Uh, but you're right. I mean, listen, what we saw the, the, interview with Amanda Balionis uh afterwards was uh, shocking I I was I was on HQ live and I saw it live on the first time on HQ and they were like react to this and I was like dude I I think I'm choked up first of all is the guy the guy in our sport that we say is the most composed he is the most emotionless he is just like completely removed from result of anything good or bad and for him to like not even be able to form a sentence uh, because he was so emotional and overwhelmed, it it was awesome. Like it was it was cool. It was real, and it's a side of him that I've never seen before. It it was awesome, and it it kind of you know we do this whole like oh DJ doesn't care and like oh, it, <laughs> right. it almost it gives you a greater appreciation for the fact that he his superpower is being able to put shots behind him. Because he clearly does care. I mean, you don't react like that unless you care a lot. And I just feel like he's very, and this is a little bit of a Rory thing, he's become pretty comfortable in his own skin. Like, he knows who he is. He just, honestly, like, here's the deal, Rick. I think he just wants to go out and play a great round of golf every day. Yeah. And, and like, how relatable is that? You know, his great golf is shooting 67 at Augusta National, which is very different than us, but... I just think it's the most relatable thing in the world. And I thought it was, I don't know, man. I, I thought the, I thought that moment was a really, really cool one. And also think that, you know, whether he shows it or not, he has heard everybody and has gotten all the questions about letting all of these major championships slip through his fingers. And we've talked about him being, you know, snake bitten at times. And we talk about, one one win or one major win is great, but a second one is a lot of validation, right? It says this, that first one was not a fluke. And for the second one to come, for your validation victory to come at Augusta, which already amplifies it, and then Tiger Woods is the one slipping the green jacket on your very tall, broad shoulders. Uh, like, yeah, it was it was awesome. He could not have scripted that any better. Yeah, he, well, if there were people there, it would have well, been. Well, sure. <laughs> uh, he, he was asked about Tiger, and he was like, yeah, it was cool, but I don't really care who's putting the green jacket on me as long as I have it, which I thought was, I thought was pretty hilarious. Um, yeah, look, I mean, you do the numbers. There's, I think, 140 
to 140, yeah, 142 guys who have won one major, and there's only 83 that have won two or more. So there's 225 total. 142 have won exactly one, and 83 have won two or more, and he's in the 83 now. And, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, just numbers-wise, it's a very different club than being in the, the 142. So I, I think that it's, it's hard to envision him not winning more. You know, he's got, I was looking at his last, since 2015, uh, 14 top 10s, I think, and 22 majors, which is a joke. Uh, four runners up and now two wins, Augusta and Oakmont. The Augusta Oakmont club is also a joke. Jack, yep. Hogan, Sneed, Sarazen, DJ, and Angel Cabrera, I think it is. I think you're right. Yes. Um, so it, it's just, I'm glad, and we've talked about this. I'm glad that the Augusta Oakmont gives credence to him being an all timer because regardless of whether he wins Augusta, you're still like your talent is still all time great. So I'm glad that he gets like the adulation from people who aren't really deep into this, into like some of the numbers and stuff, because I think he deserves it. The group of uh, even, even smaller. So you mentioned the guys who have won one major, the guys who have won two majors, there's only 17 uh, to win a U.S. open and a master. So, I mean, it, we are getting into a very short list. Um, I want to move on to some other guys, but real quick on DJ. I mean, you, you, you talked like, and I agree with you. He's, he's not done. Are, are we, first of all, the, I feel like the prime of his career has been very long, right? One win in each year for the last 13 years, I think it is now Um, the, the, the natural progression and evolution of his game from bomber to a guy who figured out his wedges that made him the number one player in the world to a guy that now seems like he's figuring out the putter better than it's ever been. Uh, like I'm scared for the rest of these guys on tour. DJ wins at kind of ridiculous rates and I don't think he's close to done. This just might, this might be opening the floodgates. Yeah. It, it, it's going to be interesting um, because I don't, I don't disagree with you, but I also don't know that there was like a, I don't know the floodgates were necessarily closed because sure. I, I don't, I didn't buy into the whole like, he hadn't, you know, he can't, he can't close. It's like, I don't know. He shoots good numbers when he's leading at 54 holes. So sure. I think the, the primary takeaway there is like, it's freaking hard to win these things, you know, like it just, there's only so many and you only, you kind of, I mean, he could think about this. He's uh, a grounded club at whistling straights and whatever that was, he hit at St. George's at two iron away from the slam. Like, but, but I mean, and not the point is not that DJ should have won the slam. The point is like, it, they're so hard to win. I think he ends with three or maybe I think he could get to four potentially. Um, one last note on DJ Rory said this after he played within the first two rounds, they play a lot, of, a lot of practice rounds together. And he said, look, there's a lot going on there. And, uh, like mentally he and he said you guys make him out to be something he didn't say these words but essentially he was saying you guys make him out to be something that he's not he's smarter than you think and I think that is really I think that's really true like I think that that his evolution has been less physical because he's always been gifted and it's been more the evolution of him mentally uh, getting to the place where we talk about his superpower being putting stuff behind him not worrying about it moving on and yet still carrying like he, he clearly we clearly saw after winning Augusta. So I just thought that was an interesting note from somebody who's played a lot of golf with him. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Rory McIlroy, but first I want to remind everyone that they can win a 55 inch smart television. We're giving one away. Here's what you need to know if you'd like a chance to win. First off, the contest is completely free to win. Go to CBS sports.com slash first cut giveaway. That link is in the description of the episode. If you're watching on YouTube, as well as in the podcast description on all podcast platforms, the contest does not end until November 20. Third, so the winner will get to watch the next Masters, which is unbelievably only five months away in crispy high definition. A couple of big names in the top 10, Kyle. One we've kind of had the natural segue to is Rory McElroy. Uh, the first round woes played him out of this event on Thursday, despite shooting 
some of the best scores on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He's going to finish T5, which we would say, great result, looks awesome, but the way he did it, right? Like, he's just, he leaves us wanting more because of the way he played over the final three rounds versus the way he played in, in round number one. Yeah, what's crazy is that over the final three, despite how good he was, he I think he still lost to DJ by two. Yeah, that's crazy. He, I, I presume he would have finished second if you just look at the last three. Well, let's see here. Rory went, so Rory beat him by uh, four there, then DJ got him by two. No, Rory would have won by one. Oh, really? Yeah, right. 70, 65, and 68 for for DJ, which is 70 plus 65 plus 68. That's 203. And then Rory. And and Rory was 15. And Rory was, no, 202. 202 to 203. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. Um, So, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's the deal, right? Like, I, I was actually trying to come up with scenarios for, like, how to, uh, like, just get Rory through the first round. <laughs> like, let Charlie Hoffman dress up in Nike gear. Or <laughs> somebody, somebody suggested playing it on Labor Day so you can play Friday through Monday instead of Thursday through oh, Sunday. Oh, so there is no Thursday Rory. <laughs> but it's so, like... It's mad. It has to be absolutely maddening for him to go out, know how good you are at that course, play that well at that course, and then be derailed because you shot a, just a bizarre 75 in the first round. I, that was the easiest day of the tournament. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every scoring record fell on Thursday, and Rory was three over par. I was about, I was about one birdie away from – running over to wherever Rory was at on Sunday because it, it, his little mini run on the first nine came right as DJ was bogeying uh, four and five. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, this is starting to feel like speed in 2018 a little bit. Um, but yeah, I just, it's gotta be so just inherently frustrating to him to look at the way he can play there. And then to look at his first rounds, he's got what two first rounds in the sixties ever. I think. And I mean, this year to go 75 and finish T five, I don't think anybody else in the top 20 shot anything close to that. So that's, no, that's gotta be, that's gotta be tough for him. Corey Connors and Kevin Na were the only two golfers to finish inside the top 23 who were even over par on Thursday. And Rory's was the worst score. Here's an interesting comment from the chat. Uh, Toto fun asks, does Rory need to make a change to a quote professional caddy rather than his mate? And I'm wondering if that is going along the lines of the fact that Rory's first round woes are mental. So the stats to back this up from Justin Ray are uh, since in major championships, since 2015 in round number one, Rory McIlroy now 28 over par in rounds two through four. He's now 64 under if it is mental how does he fix it? I don't, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, two things I would say to that one, Dustin just won with his brother on his bag. And I, and I thought, <laughs> great point. <laughs> I thought this was interesting. Austin talked about this. We interviewed him afterwards and he said, look, like I didn't really know what I was doing when I got out here. And I don't, I don't know if that's true of Harry diamond Rory's Rory's guy that's on the bag. Um, I know he's a really good amateur player. Austin's a good player, but if you were going to do it, you wouldn't do it after like four years of having him on the bag because in invariably he's, he's gotten good at the job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like, again, it's not like, you know, chemistry or like (laughs) nuclear physics or anything. You're, you're kind of like adding numbers up. Um, it's more than that. That's unfair. Um, but you know, the learning curve is probably two, three, four years. So you wouldn't do it after four years. You would have just not done it to begin with. That That's kind of like the direction I would go with that. Yeah, and and obviously every golfer is different, right? Like what works for DJ might be different than what works for Rory and Spieth and JT and everybody. So you just got to find what's right for you. Speaking of Justin Thomas, um, we've said a couple of times this year, like, oh, this one got, this one is the one that 
he kind of let get get away. I don't feel that way this time around. He shoots 71 70 on the weekend. He finishes eight shots back of Dustin Johnson, but only three shots back of, of second. He's going to finish in solo fourth. He he's really good at just putting himself in position. It sometimes feels like there's a lid on a cup or he hit, you know, one bad swing and he has trouble kind of flipping, flipping the switch a bit, but he's just so good. He's so good. You know, his trajectory at Augusta is interesting. I think he went like T37, T25, T17. Last year he was T12. This year he's T, what, four, three? So, yeah, solo four. So so April is he wins. I mean, that <laughs> – it's, it's like what and, – and I think some of that is like just learning the place. You know, Shane Lowry had a really interesting quote where he talked about, hey, I just – I wanted to make the cut because I want to – I want more competitive rounds here because I want to learn the place because someday I want to win here. And it's hard to win until you've learned more about the course. And that's just, we don't hear that ever. You know, guys go to like, no offense to Harbor Town or wherever. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I don't know. I just went out there, played the course, shot a good score. But Augusta is different. And a lot of major championship courses are that you have to kind of learn what you're doing. And I, I wonder if that's where, where JT is at is just trying to learn the different nuances of the course. I I don't, I don't know. Maybe some of it is just is, is uh, physical, but it seems like it seems more mental than anything else with him. And and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just like learning how to kind of get yourself around that place. Yeah. Uh, The, the rest of the top of this leaderboard, Cam Smith, 15 under Sung J M 15 under. I mean, Dylan Fratelli was in contention for a while. He was even par on Sunday. That's not going to get the job done for Cam Smith and Sung J who played uh, both so well. Uh, I, I don't liken this to a Phil Mickelson running into a Henrik Stenson buzzsaw at Troon, but like 15 under par and being three shots clear of the next group, right? They're three shots ahead of JT that wins a lot of masters except this one where DJ goes out and breaks all the scoring records. You have the strokes game. Do you know what the, what the, uh, uh, I, I could get it, but I don't have it handy. Yeah, master strokes game is weird too, though, because like it's such a small field and you've got amateurs and 70 year olds and whatever. Um, who, who, I guess when I look at this top, We'll call it 10. So down to Webb, Corey Connors, and Patrick Reed. Who's the one that's the most surprising? Is it Cam Smith being second, or is it is it somebody else? Surprising? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it could be Cam Smith, right? I mean, here's a guy who has – I think he has two PGA Tour titles, right? One is a team event. Yeah. And and one was Sony this year. And even though we liked him coming in, like it's a big difference when he's, you know, when we call him a sleeper and then we go through the, the preview on Monday and everybody likes him and he's 66 or hundred to one, you know, you're not actually expecting him to, to be the only guy in master's history to shoot four rounds in, in the sixties. Right. Like that's, that's even exceeding all of those expectations. So yeah, I think, uh, I think I could go with Cam Smith there. He's played well there before. Yeah, um, he finished in the top, I think five at at the U.S. Open at Chambers Bay. Uh, he felt a little Danny Willardish in that, like, oh, he's having a really good Masters, but he's probably going to get clipped by this guy who's an all timer, mm-hmm. and and if the all timer makes an eight on twelve, then maybe he wins, right? But it it doesn't feel like. And, and and this could be wrong, but it doesn't feel like he's like building on something where he's going to start top tening at all these major championships. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so all right, so let's let's transition that conversation to Sung J M, who I would argue yeah. does feel like he's building on something, right? I mean, the trajectory of his career from uh, Corn Ferry Tour, where he was what their Player of the Year, regular points winner, or whatever, to Rookie of the Year, to PGA Tour winner at the Honda Classic, to now finishing second at the Masters, and he's 22 years old. That trajectory feels a little bit different. I mean, think of we would be freaking out if this was like Matthew Wolf, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, mean, I guess we kind of were when he finished top five at the PGA and U.S. Open. Um, yeah, Sanjay was great this week. I didn't, uh, I didn't necessarily see that coming in. Um, I like him. I think he was awesome at the beginning of 2020. He hadn't been great recently. 
first he wasn't I mean he wasn't in my top three or four of first time guys playing that I, I expected could win I had I think Morikawa Wolf and Scheffler all ahead of him um he's really good he hit the ball so, I mean just off the tee he was awesome and you know I was talking to Ryan Labner of Golf Channel about this we were watching him on Sunday his short game was really impressive now yeah. I think that he was a little bit helped by some of the softer conditions because um, I, j- I don't know that his iron play is necessarily like, I mean, I know it's not DJ level. So I, I do think there was a little bit of that there, but man, he should be encouraged by, by uh, finishing 15 under at his first masters. Yeah. He, so he was actually a lot better or results wise, a lot better before, the shutdown that's when he won in honda he finished third at api uh then he had he had trouble finding it again after the restart he had a couple of of events that he popped up at but this obviously his best finish uh yeah he he goes as far as kind of when he's when he's flushing it he's on and then that short game i mean he made a couple he had a couple of up and downs around there that i was like uh, unbelievable stuff so we'll we'll see the ones that i remember six was incredible even though i think he missed the putt he did miss the putt, but it was and, still right. And then 15 was sick. Yeah. 15 is the one that I, that I'll think of like, Holy crap. How did he even, how do you do that? He's, My most surprising in the top 10 is uh, the bread man, CT pan. Yeah, that would be a surprise too. Okay. So, so he's a shorter hitter and we can talk about this later, but like Bernard longer can't move the ball out there. CT pan, uh, Mike Weir makes the cut. I mean, real quick, let's not, Let's not use Bernard Longer and Mike Weir as evidence that the game's in a great position, that there's nothing we need to do about distance. That is the, the, that is the most nonsensical – do you want to say something? I feel no, like I'm – No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm soaking this in. I'm enjoying this. Please. It's nonsense. It's like <laughs> one, of my, one of my friends who I, I don't know if he wants this out there, but I'll, I'll keep it – keep it secret said that's like when it snows saying, Oh, there's, there's nothing wrong with, there's no global warming. There's nothing (laughs) wrong with with the atmosphere. And it's true. Like you can't use one person. I saw so many people talking about this. Like that is not the point. And we'll get to Bryson in a minute, but like Bernard Longer, great for him. He's 63. He's became a grandfather. He's, he's like making the cut in the masters. That's phenomenal. It's not Mm -hmm. evidence that the game is not broken that we're, that we're, that we're not able, like that we're going to be unable to go to some of these classic courses because of how far the golf ball is going. That's not what it is. So let's stop talking about that. Also the flaw in that is uh, both of these guys are, are masters champions. And this is the course that we say experience and knowledge goes such a long way. So it's <laughs> not just like being able to bomb it out there. So they are pretty, pretty poor examples if that's how you want to deploy. Them. <laughs> and also DJ, maybe the longest guy ever, Set a new scoring record. This <laughs> yeah, DJ moves it out there pretty good. Not not just Bryson. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, just to round out this top 10, uh, so just the notables here, DJ, Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy, Brooks Kepka, John Rahm, Webb Simpson, Patrick Reed, all finished in the top 10. That is, that's some star power. Yeah, it's it's legit. Webb's had a great uh, last few Masters. You know, he quietly finished T5 last year, uh, T10 this year. I, I think that I'll take away, and I said this on our podcast earlier in the week, his quote about respecting the course a lot is something that I'll take away from this from this week. Not just for him, but just sort of kind of the way that I think about Augusta National. So, yeah, just another awesome Masters. We get 144 days until we do it again. I love it. Uh, I want to talk about the defending champion, Tiger Woods. I want to put a bow on Bryson DeChambeau, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear word from our partners. And we're back. Shortest break ever. If you're watching us live stream on YouTube, Tiger Woods, Kyle, um, he had a full week. You know, he, he went out in four under 68 on Thursday. He had the long day on I guess that would have been Saturday where he had to finish round two, play the entirety of round three. He nearly holes out for Eagle on number two on Sunday with a beautiful flop shot. And then he gets to number 12 Uh, and he does something he has never done in his entire career. 
and he takes a 10 on a hole. So here, here was my experience of Tiger's 10. I'm out with DJ and Sungjae and a- poor Abraham answer. He had a tough day. That was tough. Yeah. That was difficult. Um, I really like answer by the way, but so there's, there's only members out there, members and their spouses, some media members, some um, volunteers. And another media member came up to me and said, Hey, Peyton Manning just said, so Peyton Manning's, I, I guess he's a member. I, 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 that's, I think that's what his badge said. I don't know if that's is that like honorary or is he like actually a member? I think he's actually a member. I, I, I guess. I don't, I don't know why else he, he's not a volunteer and he's not a media member. Could you imagine uh, Peyton Manning doing the laser and like writing stuff down as a volunteer? So Peyton Manning was like locked into DJ and he was taunting one of the guys I was with. He had a, uh, a Georgia, like a university of Georgia mask on. Mm-hmm. And Peyton was like, yeah, I threw up all over that thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so uh, anyway, somebody said, hey, Peyton just said that Tiger made a 10 on 12. Because Peyton had his phone out there, which I don't, I don't know. I don't know what was going on. Different but rules for different guys, I think. <laughs> definitely different than the rules that, yes. Uh, and so Tiger made a 10. And I was like, there's no he." That he must have like looked at it wrong. I, he doesn't. Or, or it's Peyton Manning. He's messing with you. He's a you know right. funny guy. Oh, he was yeah. He was like locked into everything all week. It was it was really cool to see. Like some people are out there you know normally and they they just they just want to be seen and what he was like. He was like locked into Sung J M Iron play. It was it. it was Love phenomenal. It. But so that was how I experienced it. And then I get back and I look up Tiger's card and I was like he made a 10 on 12. What walk me through it. All right, here we go. Off, off memory, uh, steps up to 12, uh, addresses his ball backs off, trying to figure out the wind, uh, hits the first one into the bank, rolls it into race Creek, uh, goes to the drop zone, lands it on the green, spins it back into race Creek again, takes his next shot over the back into the back bunker into a very awkward situation where he is like full one leg up on the side of the bunker, just trying to get it out of there, skulls it out of the bunker back into race Creek takes a drop in the bunker, plops it out onto the green. However many that is two putts later, 10. It's never good when you're, uh, you're dropping in the bunker for seven. <laughs> never good. <laughs> I so I someone was like, that's the most relatable Tiger Woods has ever been. And I'm like, no, it's not. I would have picked up well before I got to 10. No chance I take a 10 yeah. on that hole. And also, I made a four on 12. <laughs> nice. With, with the Sunday pin. So not <laughs> relatable at all. Um the, the crazy thing is, so first of all, I mean, uh, uh you know, the Justin Ray had all the great stats, like the highest score he's ever taken on any hole, 23,000 holes or whatever he's played on the PGA was, tour. I did see that. That was great. And then and then he does something, uh, which he's also never done, Kyle, which is birdie five of his last six at Augusta National. And I'm just sitting here like, did you always have that in you today? Like, is this what we could have seen this week? Like, I don't know how a guy goes from making a 10 on 12 to birdieing five of his last six and looking like he's untouchable. Yeah, it is weird. He, he had a weird week. Um, you know, Thursday was definitely signs of life. And then over the last couple of days, you're kind of like, I don't know. It just feels like 2019 was kind of, this last hurrah, it's so hard for him to put together four days of it when, yeah. when his game is, I, I mean, I, I just, I don't, I don't see it. And maybe that flips in 2021, 2022, whatever, but he's getting older, like probably not. And so you, 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 you've got all that. And then you've got a, t- and then sort of a microcosm of it is a 10 and then five birdies. And you're like, yeah, well, that's just like, is that just what we're getting is like some good and then some really bad and then some good again. And then some really bad. That kind of feels like what the deal is. Right. And I feel like it's getting more and more difficult for him to give us the good or at least the okay for four straight days. That that's the thing. Right. And, and now, you know, we're, what'd you say? 140 something days from the April version of this. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's he going to play before that? He'll play, he'll play Tory. Like we're, we're, uh, there is no hero world challenge this year. Like might be a while before we see him again. 
uh, play. He might play players. He'll play Riviera. He'll play Riviera. Yeah. Um, and players. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't really know if I have a ton to add. He's just kind of good, but not great. But still, Tiger at certain places like Augusta, you know. Earlier in the week, he was uh, like Thursday and Friday, even Friday when he wasn't playing as well, he was out thinking everybody. He was like two shots better just with where he was leaving his ball. And like you could tell the game wasn't there. So when you get to places, and and I guess he really only plays a lot at places he's won a bunch, whether it's Torrey, whether it's Augusta National, like he's going to be he's going to gain a stroke with his brain every single round. Well, and he, he doesn't want to shoot out. Like he, you want to get into a shootout with like DJ and JT and Rory, like good luck with that. You know, he, he wants, and this is almost why I, I wonder if an open is going to be where he competes the best over the next five or six or however many years we get out of him, because you can get into an open and it's kind of weird and you, you don't have to hit, you know, depending on the venue, you don't have to hit just these DJ like shots, you can kind of work your way around a little bit and, and outthink people. And it, this week, just with how soft it was, that that was not going to happen. It, he was he was going to have to get into a shootout, and that's just I just don't know that that's where we're at with him right now. That could flip, but right now I don't I don't think that's where we're at. <laughs> Producer Jacob, if you were watching on the live stream, put up the shot tracker for <laughs> for the ten, which is like uh, unbelievable stuff. Go check that out. Um, let's put a bow on Bryson here because he was the betting favorite coming in. Um, he told us par was sixty seven. He then told us he, uh, you know, he was dizzy at times. Just it, listen, I, I don't know if the, what the health issues were. Uh, the driver didn't work. The driver was not good enough. The one thing that he told us was going to bring Augusta national to its knees was not good enough. Yeah, it wasn't. I I didn't see much of his weekend stuff. Um, I mean, the years of success, he won the U S open, right? Like I I don't, I think that, and, and when we kind of talked about this beforehand and I've hollered about it all week, like this is not going to work every, every tournament. Like he's not going to win every – and J, uh, JT said this. He goes, look, no offense to him. He's not going to win every time he plays. You know, and I want to go back. Mark said something on, I think, Friday, and I agreed with it at the time, and I still do to an extent, but I also disagree with it as well. He said pretty much if you look at every champion here, they've all played from the same positions off the tee. And I was yeah. thinking about that, and I was like, oh, okay, that, that kind of – but then I started thinking about, like, Tiger in 97 – right? Those were not positions that Ben Hogan won the Masters from. Those were not positions that Seve Ballesteros won the Masters. I mean, they freaking lengthened the course, right? you know? And so I think that there, there's something there with Bryson. I mean, obviously he's, he's playing. I mean, he finished top five at the PGA. He won the U S open. It didn't work this week. That means zero to me. That means mm-hmm. nothing. If anything, the fact that he made the cut playing like he did is actually a testament to what to his strategy. But I do think that there's something about Augusta, and this is the part that I agree with Mark on, where you can't just try to murder every hole. You have to pick and choose what <laughs> you're trying to do. And I don't know, I don't when when Bryson does like the like he kind of goes back and looks at everything, I don't I wonder what his takeaway is about okay, well, my strategy on this hole can't be that. It should be this. On, I mean, because a couple of times he played 13, you're like, oh, my gosh, he got 124 in. He almost made an albatross. Yeah. I'm, I'm very interested. Okay, so I'm glad we're only five months out from April version of this because I want to see the strategy that he deploys in April and see if it's any different. Because, listen, it, it's one thing, like, we don't know, f- for the most part, what what guys are trying to do a lot of the time but to see what clubs he uses off of certain tees i think will be interesting you know he's going to tinker you know he's going to evolve in the next five months like i don't know if he's just going to try to run this back and hit the same shots and just try to hit them straighter and try to do it better or if he's actually going to not try to murder every single hole well and and dj is an interesting case study because he's the second longest guy on tour the third longest whatever but he also picked his spots really well, really, really well. And he didn't, you know, he didn't go for the world on 15. He didn't try to burn down 13. 
and he just kept the momentum going in the right direction. And I think that's where Bryson almost, I think sometimes he tries to win the tournament on one hole and you're like, dude, you got 70 more of these. Like let's, <laughs> let's settle down. Um, so I, I'm with you. I think the, any adjustment, I don't think, I mean, what he's doing is the way to do it, but I, I wonder what adjustments, I don't think there will be that many, honestly. I, I think there'll be some, but I don't think there'll be as many as maybe people would, would imagine at Augusta National. Last thing on him, I think uh, number 13 for the week is uh, the perfect perfect microcosm, right? That that was the hole that coming into the event, we were like, oh, my God, where is he going to hit it? He's going to cut the – it's going to be wild stuff. It's going to be insane. Makes a double on Thursday, uh, birdies it on Friday, pars it on – what would that be? Saturday and almost makes a two and makes a Eagle on Sunday. He plays it at one under. So like on the surface, one under on 13 is not what Bryson was going for, but it goes to that whole like range of outcomes things, right? He's, he's going to expand the range of outcomes to the extremes. And sometimes that's going to backfire and sometimes it's going to be awesome. Well, and that's what, what was so remarkable about what he did at Wingfoot is he, he didn't bring those huge numbers into play. You know, like yeah. he, he was just so, and, and I, th- I think he, honestly, like, is it as simple as like, he just hit driver a lot better at Wingfoot than he did at Augusta national. It, it might be. I mean, I, I don't, you know, we don't get like the full strokes gain numbers and all that stuff, but we could go back and look. I mean, it just felt like he was all over the place with the driver this week. Terrible off the tee. I mean, and he got a couple of bad breaks and whatever, but I, I just, I don't know that. I just don't know that you completely like go back to the drawing board on it. I think it's just, Hey, hit driver better because that's what you do, you know? So I don't know. I, I I'm with you. I, I, and look, you know, people were talking people like, as we were following DJ around, we're like, I'm ready to be done with Bryson. I'm like I can't get enough. Like, this is the best. <laughs> yeah, man. He was, he was prime time viewing every single time he put his club oh, behind the ball. Great. It was unbelievable. All right, KP. 2020 masters in the books, any final thoughts, anything that we did not talk about? Uh, no, I'm just glad it happened. You know, I, I saw uh, chairman, the chairman of Augusta national Fred Ridley was walking around with Rory's group and with DJ's group on Sunday. And everybody was just kind of thanking him for um, just putting it together because yeah. it, it, it would have been easy to just not do it. And it wasn't, it was very different. You know, the juice wasn't there on Saturday and Sunday. Um, it felt different. Um, but it was awesome that it happened and I'm glad DJ won. I think DJ is freaking all time. And I think he's so, he's become so easy to root for. And we had a great major season. How about that? Morikawa, Bryson, DJ. That's awesome. That's really, really good. I'm glad you were there to, to take it all in, to be our eyes on the scene. Oh, how about this? Uh, the lines are already out for the 2021 masters. <laughs> <laughs> the sun has barely set on this one. <laughs> let, let me guess. Uh, I think Bryson's still the favorite. He, he, he is at the co-favorite with Dustin Johnson. Yeah. Yes. They are both seven to one. Wow. Seven, seven. That's yes. a pretty, that's a pretty low number. We used to see tiger in like the three and four. Yeah. Uh, what's Rory nine. Rory's nine, Rom is 10, along with Justin Thomas. So those are the big five. And then there's a bit of a gap down to Brooksy at 16. And Xander, who, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about this week because he kind of just hovered around. Uh, Xander's at 20. Okay. Xander at 20 is interesting. Yeah, I might have to get on that before he, like, because if he wins anything between now and then, like, this number is definitely getting much shorter than that. Yeah, for sure. Where did he finish this week? T-17. Yeah, 67, him, 73, 71, 70. Him and Brooks were kind of just sort of there, but not – I mean, it was a little – Rory got a little closer, but none of those guys were ever, like, really, really in it. It didn't feel like. No, it didn't. It didn't. Um, cool. All right. Awesome stuff. I, I think we've done it. Great week. Kyle Porter, thank you very much. You can find him on Twitter at Kyle Porter CBS. Producer Jacob behind the glass with all the good stuff this week and every week. You can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut, and we'll catch you next time.